Okay, today we're going to go over basic um, mixing. So on our little sticky pad here, it says we're going to be looking at the tools of um, mixing, which would be an EQ, a compressor, and a side chain. There are many more for the purposes of uh, stereo and mono mixing and stuff, but we're just going to look at this because this is basic. And um, some things I might talk about, or you, like in instrument types, I mean, will be um, a bass. You have your bass, your synth, and your percussion. That's all I need to worry about for right now, just for like the very basics of everything. Your synth is kind of like your treble stuff. So, uh, yeah. I will leave that around. So, I have a, a thing put together here. It's got one bass line, one synth synthesizer line, and it's got some, some drums and such on top here. So let's take a look at that and see what this sounds like. <laughs> And this is the bass line, chords, we got a kick, very standard electro, and then a drum, um, like hi-hats and stuff, all being played together. So you'd notice that that didn't sound quite good doesn't really sound good. So what we're gonna do to make it sound better is basically take our bass line and just EQ it and compress it to make it sound better. And we do that with the chords we have as well. And then we're gonna take those two instruments and side chain them um, so, they, so they fit in better to the mix. So we'll side chain them. We'll actually just take out um, the percussion parts for, for the basic. And I'll, they'll pop up in the advanced again because that's part of like drum mixing really um so yeah we we have this stuff here so let's go ahead and look at our bass um what we're gonna do is when you're eqing a bass you want to make sure you have a fundamental tone it's between 100 hertz to 200 hertz so you, you want to Basically make sure that any kind of fundamental tone you have in a song and a sound isn't too much because you got to remember you're going to be having many other instruments playing with that sound, which means you're going to have a really loud fundamental frequency in your mix. And what that's going to do is um, ruin your master, any kind of master chains you have like compression or uh, any kind of mastering, I guess you have going on in your song. So you want to avoid having these large peaks of frequencies in a, in a mix. It creates problems. So, like, you don't want them all to be... You don't want to have, like, 24 decibels at, like, your your root key of your song. Because it's going to be, like, really ruining your mix. And it's not going to sound very well. So, usually for basses, you want to kind of take down the the root key. Find where it is through exploring this is the best way right here that i can say is good for exploring your sound that you've created and really understanding it and figuring out what needs to be done to it in terms of eqing you can hear what kind of effect the eq has on it and already i can tell that something over in the 110 area is going to need to be done because this is a bass that's where the f the fundamental tone is going to be you can hear the differences i'm making to it that already does a lot but if there's a lot of stuff you have in the mid as well as that's uh, causing problems you'd want to take that down as well it depends on the sound the way it was created and such uh, when you get towards higher frequencies the likeliness of having all those waves being perfectly in phase and lining up because of how fast they're moving is really unlikely so you, for the most part um, you're not going to have a lot of problems in the high end with lots of things being up there in the high end. Obviously, if you have really stupidly screechy things, they're just annoying. You don't want to 
you don't want to have those at all. So um, I have an EQ for this bass right here. It's not much. You can see what I did down here with the numbers. You can hear the difference. So that's that's your main most important tool you have is an EQ, whether or not it's like in the plugin or what, but this is just an audio sample. So yeah, and now we're gonna go onto a compressor, uh, which basically, it just messes with the dynamic range of a sound. So what I'm using it to do is I'm trying to EQ out the parts that I feel like are too loud in the sound or are going to be used by other instruments. And then I'm using a compressor to kind of make all the frequencies even and flat in terms of like um, maximum volume. And then I'm also trying to like get as much punch out of a sound as I can by reducing quite a lot of dynamic quite a lot of dynamic range. I don't know if you can see this in an oscilloscope. You, you can see the difference there. It's got like more oomph to it at the end. It's like a reverse kick kind of. So that's why compressing is good. You can always mess around with the compressor settings to feel to see what's nice. Uh, depending on the visual aspects of your compressor, that might do the job for you as well. So this is about it for doing a bass um, in terms of basic EQing. And then when you go into your chords or like any kind of synths, basically, um, you have a bass. It's taking up all that low stuff around 250 hertz and lower. So why would you want your my chords to, or your synths to also do that as well? Because listen to these. They have quite a lot of bass in there. So why would I want that to be on top of this already heavy bassy sound, right? That makes no sense. So what I'm going to do is come in here, take an EQ. I, I already cut the stuff after 240 hertz. I like to use steep slopes. I use a, a four slope, which is just 24 decibels per octave. Um, or other known, otherwise known as like a 24, I guess just a 24 uh, low pass or like a four, a four pass or whatever. Um, so I, yes, I like to do that. Um, and I like to raise the high stuff in a synth to really exaggerate the fact that it's a synth. <laughs> those differences that each of those parts of the EQ have and then even more apparent when you put a compressor on there it's amazing how little tiny tiny effects on an EQ can massively change the sound and then because this is a synthesizer and I wanted to have some stereo to it which will be later explained I like to put some reverb on there This audio sample in specific does have reverb on it, but it's not for this project specifically. So it just ends when I turn off the audio clip. So I just add a little bit of my own reverb to kind of uh, help that. Um, on my bass as well. Like it doesn't sound like it's coming from a room. So like it, if I were to play this on speakers, record it into a room and then re-record it being played into this room, that's that's how you get reverb so what the idea is even though I'm making EDM in terms of mixing it really helps if you have all your instruments sounding like they're played in a room and then recorded into a mic a really high high quality mic apparently but uh, it just helps create like a sense of space instead of like everything super tight and all like really mono which kind of like prevents you 
which gets rid of the point of even having two headphones left and right speaker because mono could just be played at one speaker that you're staring down right and it's just looking at you right in the face so i like to put a little bit of reverb on my basses for them usually which make them sound like this you have your own reverb plugins that will do this kind of stuff fl studio has the fruity reverb 2 which is amazing um the rc series by native instruments is also very nice um for for a reverb plugin bitwigs reverb plugin is absolutely stunning as well it's got a really nice metallic sound because it's like a multi-band reverb um yeah so that's the bass that's the bass now and the uh, synths done so let's play them together <laughs> They don't sound like they're conflicting with each other anymore, which is the whole point of what you do when you mix, because you don't want your sounds to be just having troubles with each other. Like that. And you can also notice on the top left corner all this clipping. That's badness. So um, I'm going to activate these again. Now if we play it again, you'll notice there won't be as much clipping. almost been eliminated it's pretty hard to completely eliminate clipping and still keep things loud um yeah so that's that if you can see that already if in a in a mix if you can mix it very well without a master limiter that's a good sign that you're you're on the right track even though it might not sound good you're 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 getting there but you're not all the way there i guess um so yeah, I have these two sounds mixed together, but now I still have this problem where they don't sound good with the drums. You know how I'm going to solve that? Well, I'm going to take my instruments and sidechain them. Sidechaining basically just lowers the volume of sounds when, when you want it to. So whether or not you play a MIDI note or... You trigger it with, um, like a kick and a snare, or or audio samples. I guess is the better way of saying that. So I have it being triggered by an audio sample, which is this, this one here, and this guy looks like this. This is what he looks like in Bitwig. It's um a really small amount of time. The reason I have all this dead space here is just so um. It looks bigger on the editor so I can grab it easier without having to like zoom in real close with it because if it was half the size it'd be crazy. That's how I like to do my uh, my side chaining. I like to trigger it so that way I can lower the volume of the trigger and reduce the like total side chain compression without going into the actual dynamics here and like twisting all these knobs to like fine tune the um, side chain. This is nice to change the signal of the input. That's not your kick. So yeah, I'm going to turn one of those on. I use the dynamics from Bitwig Studio. Very, very, very nice plugin for um, this purpose for side chaining. That's what it was invented for. Same thing, Ableton's glue compressor and FL Studio's Fruity Limiter are fantastic plugins. Fruity Limiter is a great compressor and a great um side chainer which is sweet and actually ableton's glue compressor is pretty good at like you know gluing a sound together like as a as a bus as a bus compressor as well though that works really well for that but cubase 8.5's side chainers their compressors are total garbage and i really wish they would let vst3's as side chainers work because you can't even use anything of them anyways I have the side chain on now, so we're going to look at the actual effect it has on the audio for mixing, and uh, this is what it is. So you have this sound. Obviously looking at this oscilloscope down here. Now this is with the side chaining. Oh, weird. Those look like... So basically... This is showing me the audio level in terms of volume. 
that's not the real one that's increased. This is what it actually looks like here. So what you can see here is that these sounds are actually supposed to go like this. So with every like eighth note or quarter, every quarter note being beat being replaced with like kind of lowered volume because of this ducking from the side chain that really helps like that's literally a spot for that loud kick to fit right into so let's try to listen to this like like this <laughs> You can see how there's some spots where it's getting like loud, but if we were to actually turn on side chaining now and listen to this, you can see how it's kind of like kick chord, like kick chord kind of deal going on. Which is what you want. You want the you want all the music to have the rhythm of your drums, which if that makes any sense, I guess. Um in terms of electro, at least that's where a lot of electro comes from. Because if I, even if I took away this kick, stop it. You can see though that they're that while this is playing, it's making room for those kicks to fill it up. Because if not, it'd just be too loud. So that's that's the point of side chaining. To get your mix looking kind of like as flat as possible so you can maximize volume or like like intensity and stuff like that so much um yes yeah, so this is like basic mixing right here notice how i'm not using any kind of um, my my uh, peak limiter is off, so there is like no clipping, and I find most times when making a song, unless you're gonna lower your master volume to like negative twenty decibels or something, or probably like negative six, um, negative ten, you're gonna get a lot of clipping all the time. Like I mean, when I first started in FL Studio, like everything I did clipped. I used to like make all my songs on like sixty percent volume or something, and I felt like such a cheater when I did that. It took me about like um, uh, four months before I realized um, that putting a limiter on my master track was okay if I actually made a solid mix when I was putting my instruments together, because then my peak limiter wouldn't be actually changing what I'm what I should be hearing. Because if you were to take the limiter off, then the whole song would sound different. Whereas if you mix it properly with a limiter on, and, you, and you're constantly taking the limiter off, like not constantly, but every now and then a check, you won't be surprised. Like, wow, the song doesn't sound the same without the peak limiter on, which is not how it should be. Granted, the peak limiter should be able to make your song sound better, not, like, worse. Which can happen very easily if you're not mixing right. And it can it makes it easier to do like multi-band compression and all sorts of things on the after. So yeah. This is the basic the mixing. Basic mixing. Thanks for watching.